Hello and welcome to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm your host, Prudence Robertson. Mary saved her life. Mari Wagner is the young founder of West Coast Catholic, a booming company where she designs beautiful handmade rosaries. But before she started her business, Mari had an encounter with the Blessed Mother that she says saved her life. We bring you her story. Activating young people. Polling shows that when young people know the reality of abortion, they reject it. How can we encourage pro-life young people to make their voices heard? We're joined by Father Nathan Ford, a priest with the Canons Regular of St. John Cantius, who shares about his vital work as chaplain of a large pro-life high school group in Chicago. Transforming the culture. Maria Paula Aldana works in countries throughout South America to spread the message of theology of the body. Born in Colombia, she was inspired to start her ministry, Somos Suyos, after she converted and became pro-life. This week, we are highlighting some of the young people in our movement motivated by their faith to protect life and change the culture. We'd first like to introduce you to Mari Wagner. She and her husband Trey founded West Coast Catholic together in 2018. Both in their 20s, their mission is to create products that provide a touch of the divine to their customers' everyday lives. Their inspiration was one simple rosary, a gift from Trey to Mari that he made for her. Together, the two of them have designed thousands of rosaries since then and expanded their inventory to include beautiful prayer journals, clothing, and accessories. We were honored to meet Mari and hear her story at Seek 2024. Take a look. Thanks for being here with us. Yeah. So you are the founder of West Coast Catholic alongside your husband, Trey. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about your story. Yeah, yeah, so the pro-life movement is really close to my heart. Um, my mom actually was pregnant uh, when she was 19 in college and it was very much unplanned. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, the Lord really worked through Mary um, in her heart to get to where we are today and you know allow me to be here in this world. So uh, my family's from Colombia, South America, and abortion back then was illegal. I'm not sure if it's legal now, but it was illegal back then. Um, so when she was pregnant, she was she was terrified. You know, she felt like. Um, you know, her life was over and she didn't really have a lot of options. And in Colombia, people are very culturally Catholic. And mm -hmm. so she knew in her heart that abortion wasn't right. Um, but even still, the people around her and even her doctor said that they could find options for her if she wanted an abortion. Wow. Um, and so she really considered it. And it was really through a miracle um, that our Blessed Lady uh, did for her that revealed uh, the Lord wanting for her to keep the baby. So my grandma, she had this rose garden in the back of her house um, and there was a statue of Mary that was in the garden and my mom uh, went out there to pray um, after this appointment with the doctor and she she just broke down. You know, she was 19, she was terrified and she went to Mary um, because she knew that Mary understood what she was feeling. She knew that Mary was a young woman who also had an unplanned pregnancy right. um, and that she would understand her fear. And she said, Mary, if you want this baby to be born, if the Lord wants this baby to be born, please show me something, please show me a sign. And she specifically asked for a coral rose to grow in the garden. And they didn't have any coral roses in the garden ever. And she asked for coral because coral is her favorite color. Yeah. And uh, the doctor had given her a time frame that she had to decide between. So the day before she had to decide, she went back out to the garden about a week later um, to pray again and to offer this prayer to Mary. And right next to the statue was this fully bloomed coral rose. And she just knew in her heart I always get emotional when I talk That's about a this. <laughs> she just knew in her heart that the Lord and Mary were saying, like, yes, this life is good, and um, you should absolutely keep the baby. You know, every life is a gift. Um, and so I love the pro-life movement, and Mary um, saved my life pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> and wow, I mean, look at the gift of your life now. The work that you do full-time yes. glorifies Mary and her son. Talk to me about how 
her role as the patroness of the unborn yes. motivates you in your work today. Absolutely. I believe that beauty brings people to God and Mary brings people to God. And I've seen that so much in my own life. And we see how that drives our mission and our business um, because essentially we want people to come to know the Lord, but sometimes you need kind of a gentle, warm embrace. And that is Our Lady. And so she is our patroness. We ask for her intercession constantly um, to be able to yeah, work through our designs and our ministry and our content to bring people to the Lord. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. And we're here at SEEK with nearly 20,000 young people, young mm -hmm. Catholics from around the country. Talk to me about what it means to you to be here yeah. um, and really the significance of the fact that so many young people would want to come to yes. an event like this. Yes. It is so exciting for me to be here. So I'm a content creator on Instagram. That is how our ministry started. And so it's a very unique experience um, doing ministry this way, because for me, I've been doing it for the past five years, yeah. but my experience on this side of the screen doesn't really change, even though the follower count continues to increase, because it's always me in my sweats, on the couch, on this side of the phone. <laughs> um, and being here at Seek is amazing, because I am given the opportunity to meet all the women that I get to minister to every single day on the screen and kind of put a face to those women and so that is my favorite part of Seek. It means so much to be here and to meet the community that supports West Coast Catholic and that follows along and um, yeah I just think it is incredible and I am so grateful for the Lord to bring all these young people together because it's truly inspiring yeah. and just instills so much hope in us. I think the state of the secular world around us can be very discouraging and you know speaks a lie that the faith is uh, dying out, that the faith isn't necessary, and this is proof that that's wrong. Yeah. This is proof that young people today love the Lord and want to seek that community and live Him out, and it's just so inspiring to yeah, be here. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the rosary. Yes. Um, and really just the peace that praying the rosary can bring. You know, I personally um, know that on days that I pray the rosary, I feel peace, mm -hmm. as opposed to days that I don't. Could you yeah. kind of speak to that? Yeah. It is Mary's grace. I always say it's it's like math, like one plus one equals two. It works every time. <laughs> Same with the rosary. And I think it's so necessary for generations of today. You know, we experience so much anxiety, so much stress. Um, and the rosary, like you said, just brings peace. Yeah. And the way I see it, like I said before, it's kind of like that warm embrace of a mother. Like when you're little and you feel nervous or you are hurt or something and you run to your mom and you hang on to her leg or you look for a hug from her. That's what the rosary is. It's a way for Mary to just uh, yeah, wrap her mantle around you and just give you her heart and her love and her motherly embrace. And so we love the rosary at West Coast Catholic. It's how <laughs> we started. Um, we actually have a rosary called the Madonna Rosary, uh, where 50% of those are donated to pro-life pregnancy centers. We wanted to make sure that we really, you know, speak about this mission that we care so much about that is so close to our hearts. And so this past year, we're really excited to announce we were able to donate $15,000 to a new pro-life psych pregnancy center in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. Oh, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Live saved, right? there. Yes, yes. Mari, thank you for joining me. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. Mari's story brought tears to my eyes when I first heard it, and she's not the only one we met at SEEK. Father Nathan Ford is a priest of the Canons Regular of St. John Cantus. Based in Chicago, the order has a special calling to lead and minister to high schoolers. Father Nathan is the chaplain of the pro-life group Crusaders for Life. Here's his story. Okay, so Father, you uh, lead the Crusaders for Life mm -hmm. as a part of your ministry within your order. Talk to me a little bit about what you do. Yeah, the Crusaders for Life were founded at our parish about 20 years ago or so. And it's uh, our pro-life teen group that was founded there, but it's spread to other parishes as well, where we probably have, at this point, maybe seven, 800 kids that are involved in it, um, really across the Midwest. but. I'm the chaplain at our parish at St. John Cantius um, for, the, for the group that's there. So I oversee their spiritual um, growth in this area. I oversee some of the meetings. We have a lot of them they, uh, that work organizing it. Um, so a president, vice president, and they, they do a lot of the work, but I, I help oversee their efforts and speakers that come in. and then leading them to marches and rallies throughout the Midwest and the country even. so That's wonderful. And speaking of uh, kind of ministering to these young people, we're here at SEEK with nearly 20,000 yeah, young people from all over the country. Could you speak to the importance of having priestly, fatherly figures in their lives, especially in a culture that's increasingly against our faith? We're increasingly seeing attacks against what is true and what is beautiful. 
I think it's really important for them to have spiritual fathers in their lives because so many kids these days are coming from broken homes and broken families. There's that even broken trust within, you know, institutions, even the church that's there. And so to have solid men and even women, right, who are able to lead them and to be spiritual fathers, be spiritual mothers um, in this time of need is really important for them to help guide them through all the mess that's out there in the world. Because kids these days are encountering things, I'm not that old, I'm only 30, but I didn't encounter in my upbringing. And so to have that and to have someone that they can trust and someone they can turn to, I think is really important. Right. And in the context of the abortion issue, that's really important too. having male leaders, strong men who are pro-life. Um, could you talk to me a little bit about your role as a, as a pro-life man within our broader movement? I think it's to it's for it's important for us to witness that this this isn't OK and this isn't bringing healing and this isn't dignifying women or, or helping them in this moment of need and hurt and pain and confusion that they find themselves in. And that's important for us, even as men. A lot of times, you know, pro-choices would say they don't want to hear from men, all right? They have no role in this, but we absolutely have a role in this. We have a big role in this. Yeah. And so for us to be there and to witness is important. And I think, I always think to St. Joseph and that calm presence but he's present, right? And he's there. So one of the big things is our kids, the Crusaders, you know, they not only go to rallies, right? They're known for their balloons and their drums and all of that. And they're bright yellow. They're bright yellow, <laughs> yeah. But they go to clinics regularly. Every month, you know, 6.30 a.m., there's 30 high schoolers downtown Chicago praying outside. And half or more are men, are young men, high schoolers, college students, who are outside praying, you know, being that sometimes silent witness that, hey, like this isn't the answer, but we're gonna stand here and we're gonna be here and we're gonna pray for you. And I think that's really important uh, for men to have that role. Yeah, that's a beautiful witness. And talk to me a little more about the activities that the Crusaders are involved in in the Chicago area. So the Crusaders are involved in a lot in the Chicago area. We meet once a month and we have different speakers come in, whether that's Students for Life or Aid for Women, um, and they get a lot of good formation, and then they ha they'll have breakout sessions and be able to talk in small groups. So that happens monthly. But then they are, they're also going to the abortion clinics to pray regularly. We participate in any rallies um, or events that happen in downtown Chicago. Um, but our main focus has been, really since the overturning of Roe v. Wade, on a national level, is at that state level, especially going to Springfield, to the capital, Illinois, Needs a lot of prayers, a lot of witness. Yes. So we've been going down there and we bring several hundred kids down there to participate and to pray and to help, you know, make sure that our voices are heard while Congress is in session there. So that, that's a big, big part of our focus. Yeah, and that's very important in such a strongly pro-abortion state, right on the border of Missouri, where we're, right. we're at now, that's very pro-life. Right. Um, before I let you go, Father, could you tell me a little bit, for our viewers who don't know, about St. John Cantius and uh, kind of his witness and his, his leadership role? Yeah, St. John Cantius was a college university professor, and he was, he was the chaplain to young people. And they would always go to Father John, this holy and loving, this gentle witness that was there. He taught theology, but he was also the chaplain at the, the church right across the street, St. Anne's. And so students would flock to him for confession and guidance because college students haven't changed that much in 600 years. <laughs> There's still a lot of confusion and turmoil. Sure. And so um, through his just his gentle witness and his charity that he was known for, um, he was able to save a lot of people and help them through a lot of confusing times. And so that's something that we as an order, the canons, try to emulate. And something I myself working with young people, whether it's the Crusaders or any young people that come to me as a priest, you know, I look to Father John to be that, that mentor for me, that example. Right, a perfect example for today's priests and seminarians. Father, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Coming up, President Biden's White House still seems to be living in the Roe versus Wade era. This week, they announced their efforts to keep expanding abortion. Plus, we hear from a young woman from Colombia about her mission to share the teachings of Pope St. John Paul II's theology of the body with her peers throughout South America.
You're watching EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Prudence Robertson. Welcome back to our program. Now for your top stories of the week, the Biden administration announced an expansion of their efforts to get American women on contraception and to opt for abortions. President Biden's new task force will ensure the enforcement of the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act, also known as EMTALA. The administration says this law requires hospitals to perform emergency abortions, even in states where laws have been enacted that ban most killings of unborn children. Federal agencies are also issuing guidelines that would use tax dollars to make contraceptives free. The White House announced all of this on Monday, which marked 51 years since the Roe v. Wade decision, in which the Supreme Court invented a right to abortion. The administration's priorities were made clear in the press briefing room. If it's in Roe, then that's what he wants to see. Whatever is in Roe, what Roe was when it was a con constitutional law, that's what the president wants to see restored. He's been very clear about that. That was President Biden's White House press secretary, Corrine Jean-Pierre's response to EWTN's Toby Capian when he asked her if the president supports painful late-term abortions. Here's more of their exchange. He also said he wants to be a president for all Americans, but how in this situation with this issue does he best represent the pro-life Americans who want to see more unborn babies safe? What I will say is majority of Americans, majority of Americans wants to be able to, wants, want women to be able to make those deeply, deeply personal decisions on their bodies, on their own, not politicians. That's what majority of Americans want to see. And so the president's going to stand with majority of Americans on this issue. Do those unborn babies have any rights then? I'm not going to get into that specific. I'm not going to get into that question. The day before the National March for Life, the Knights of Columbus and Marist poll released a new poll that shed some light on where Americans stand when it comes to abortion. 58% of Americans identify as pro-choice or pro-abortion, and a third of respondents believe abortion should be allowed without any limits. 40% of respondents identified as pro-life. A little over 60% of Americans agreed that an in-person visit with a health care professional should be required for anyone seeking a chemical abortion. And more than 80% of respondents support pregnancy resource centers that help mothers during and after pregnancy. Former President Donald Trump won the New Hampshire primary by double digits on Tuesday against former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley. Trump garnered about 55 percent of the vote, with Haley tallying around 43 percent. Despite another primary loss, Haley is not throwing in the towel yet on her presidential bid. Defending life in the womb continues to be a topic of major importance in the elections, and Democrats are banking on the fact that many Americans still want to see some allowances for abortion. When the Republican primary race does come to an end, the GOP candidate for president will be up against a Democrat campaign that's saying, quote, a vote for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris is a vote to restore Roe, and a vote for Donald Trump is a vote to ban abortion access across the country. These are the stakes in 2024. This week, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris appeared together at a pro-abortion rally in Virginia. The vice president will continue touring around the country to stump for abortion, and the campaign has deployed spokespeople to battleground states such as Arizona, Florida, Nevada, and more to echo their pro-abortion message. And come rain, come shine, come snow, the pro-life movement marches on. Tens of thousands of pro-life advocates braved freezing temperatures last Friday to march through the streets of D.C. for the unborn. And across the country in San Francisco, a little rain did not stop thousands of pro-lifers from marching through the Golden Gate City. Missed out on the pro-life festivities? Go to our EWTN YouTube page to watch the rallies and see highlights. And to wrap up our show, I'm excited to introduce you to Maria Paula Aldana, who's using digital media to share with her peers the church's teachings on sexuality. Born and raised in Colombia, Maria Paula was deeply invested in the pro-abortion movement when she had a powerful encounter with God. Now she teaches John Paul II's theology of the body across South America through her organization, Somos Suyos, which in Spanish means we are his. Here's her incredible testimony. Tell me about your organization and what inspired you to start it. So uh, I was doing law school a couple years ago and I was not really like following my faith. I was actually pretty much an atheist at that point. I was gathering a lot of people around 
a lot of misconceptions on sexuality. I was a leader in many of these abortion uh, pro-choice campaigns and feminism and many other things when wow. I was doing law school. And then I encountered Christ when I was 20 years old. Totally changed my life. I fell in love with this man that actually loved me first. And I started wondering if what I was doing was actually what I was called to do. I went two years away to do discernment with the Franciscans in, in my country. I'm from Colombia. And I did that for two years. I discerned that the God, God was not really calling me for the re religious life. But I would see, when I was with my sisters, we would visit seminaries. And I would see the priests and the young seminarians taking Bible classes and theology classes. And we were not doing that. So I would just take a glimpse in the window and I was <laughs> tired, like tearing up because I really wanted to do that. So I decided to enter theology as a laywoman. And I'm doing, I've been doing, I already finished my philosophy course of the career Wonderful. and I'm in first year theology. And during the pandemic, actually even when I was in the, in the monastery, I had this deep encounter with Christ, but the sexual wounds that I had in my life were just in standby. I was doing all of this like deep knowledge of the faith and many things were happening in my spiritual life, mm -hmm. but deep down my emotional like side of things and the sexual wounds that I had were untouched. And I had no resources to start healing that. So mm -hmm. I, when pandemic hit, I was already preaching, like I was preaching in parishes and I was leading like what you would call in America uh, youth ministers. I was doing that already, but you know, still struggling with many of the things. And I'm not ashamed of saying it, I always do, you know, I was struggling with porn addiction, masturbation and many other things that we really don't have as much resources in Latin America as you guys do in the States. Right. It's something unheard of, especially when it comes to the Catholic Church. So I was, during the pandemic, I was already preaching and doing all these things, and someone sent me this online conference about theology of the body. I've never heard of it. I signed up for it, and I was, I remember I was cleaning my bathroom because I was, you know, doing the, the weekend chores. Sure. And I was covered in soap, and I started hearing this guy preaching theology of the body, and I was crying my eyes out, like covered in soap, and crying my eyes out, because I, I, I was looking for my place in the church for a long time. In the monastery, I was looking for it. Is it the Franciscan side of it? Is it preaching in parishes? Is it? And when I heard theology of the body, I felt this deep like confirmation in my heart. Jesus telling me, "This is your place in the church. Like theology of the body is your place in the church." Wow. You know, and I started just diving into it really quick. I started, you know, mixing sexual education with proper theology and Catholic theology. Right. I, I formed myself in sexual education in Argentina in a very, very good program from the Catholic Church. And then I started doing Theology of the Body with Christopher West in the Theology of the Body Institute, you know, online. Yes. And then I started, I already had a ministry online, you know, this Instagram accounts that you open up during the pandemic to share the faith and stuff. And then I just started sharing about Theology of the Body and it blew up. Obviously, this importance of reclaiming sexuality, healing from sexual wounds is such an important part of the fight for life, the fight to stop abortion. Um, can you speak to that a little bit? The fact that this is really where that ministry starts, that pro-life mission starts. Of course, um, I'm from Colombia. Yes. Not Colombia, Colombia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and unfortunately, my country has many great things, but we're one of the most progressive countries in Latin America when it comes to abortion. Yes. Our legal system, our justice system is really, really moving alongside one of the most progressive um, sentences in the world when it comes to abortion. Uh, at first, we had like three main causes for allowing abortion. It's not that it's legal. We've never had a Roe v. Wade sentence, but uh, it's decriminalized. Yes. And what that means is that in my country, you can abort a nine-month-year-old child. And it happens, it has happened, it happens every day. And when you work with communities, because I'm part of also the pro-life movement in Colombia, yes. when, you, when you go to the field, when you talk to women, when you talk to young girls that are pregnant, what you find over and over and over again is that they offer abortion as a solution, but then after the abortion that is supposed to be free, but not really free, someone's paying for it, mm -hmm. after the abortion, that woman, that girl, that child is left in the same conditions as she was before. Poverty, 
lack of education, lack of opportunities. And when you talk to them about what led them to abortion was not, you know, the empowerment of women and feminism. I don't have a job. That's the answer. I fell in love with someone that never loved me back. Mm -hmm. I fell in love and he wanted me to have sex. I really didn't want it. I didn't even enjoy it. But I wanted to be loved. So for me, the theology of the body and you know this good news about who you are and the love of God and actually making it possible to be, you know, translated in terms of sexual education and public policies yeah. is actually leading us to the root of the problem. They need to be educated, not just here, they are needing a lot of it, but they need education in the heart. They need their hearts, their affectivity, their emotional needs to be met in a lucid and proper and, you know, free way. And in that way, if we can start working in this, and I know it might not be the huge impact that we're looking for, like, uh, you know, combating a Roe v. Wade or being the post Roe v. Wade generation like you guys are in here for us is more like, if we are able to start educating and catching one mind at a time, one conscience at a time, one heart at a time, we're gonna have a full generation of young people that are not even going to consider abortion as an option. So it doesn't matter if it's legal or not. At one point, because I was doing law, I was so frustrated because I thought, we're not doing anything. They right. keep legalizing stuff. They keep pulling these sentences up. And Jesus was whispering in my heart, we're not battling for this to be legal. We're battling for this to be unimaginable in the hearts of young women and men. And you are able to do that because I'm sending you to do that. So one girl at a time, one family at a time, one school at a time. I've been called to many schools and it's mind blowing for me because I'm a Catholic. Yes. And I'm professing the Catholic faith when it comes to sexuality. And they're calling us, so please, we've done everything. Contraception, you know, the feminism movement, we've done everything. And the numbers are just going up. Yeah, nothing else works. Nothing else works. Besides the truth. Exactly. Yes. Thank you so much for joining me, Maria. It was an honor to have you on. And congrats on your work. Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you for inviting me and for all your questions. It's a pleasure. And thank you for everything that you guys do in EWTN. We love your content in Spanish. And we'll be happy to keep working with you guys. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Prudence Robertson. Don't forget you can find us at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, X, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. And if you're interested in more news from our nation and world, go to EWTN.com forward slash pro-life and sign up for our newsletter, The Pro-Life Pulse. Remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.